All right. Hey there, folks. Since book tour and conventions are still somewhat on hold, I figured I'd bring book tour to you. So as we head into the final shows of the season, tonight's a bit of a celebration as this is my 50th official episode of Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster, intriguing interviews with creative minds. So a special shout out goes to everyone who's helped out behind the scenes, the nearly 100 guests who have been on the show, and of course, to everyone who, who tunes in to watch. And what a better way to kick off my 50th broadcast and with tonight's guest, the international award-winning science fiction author, Gareth L. Powell. Gareth has written numerous novellas, short stories, and comic strips, and is best known for his Embers of War and Ak Ak Makaki trilogies. I hope I said that right. You can correct me if I'm not. Embers of War won the 2018 BSFA Award for Best Novel and was shortlisted for the 2019 Locus Awards and the 2021 Sion Awards in Japan. Its sequels, Fleet of Knives and Light of Impossible Stars, were both shortlisted for the BSFA Award for Best Novel, and Fleet of Knives was also shortlisted listed for the 2020 Locus Awards. Welcome, Gareth. Hi. All right, good to see you. All right, just a heads up to the folks at home. Feel free to send me notes or questions you have for me or Gareth in the chat box during the show, and we'll get to a few at the end. All right, Gareth, as we always do, we'll start at the beginning. So where were you born and where'd you grow up? Well, I was, um, I was born at a very early age. Um, <laughs> I was uh, born in Bristol, in a, an area of Bristol called Clifton, which is next to the Suspension Bridge, which some people may have heard of. It was designed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel um, and is over uh, Bristol Gorge, which is like 300 feet deep gorge. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I grew up on the banks of the River Avon there. And, you know, um, yeah, I was very fortunate um, when I was at school to win a short story competition. Hold on, I, I want to hear all about that, but we're skipping over some good stuff. So we'll, we'll get okay. to that. So, so you, so you're growing up. So Bristol is on the, is pretty far on the west, on the western coast of the UK, correct? That's right. Yes. Right. All right. About, I don't know, about midway, about midway down somewhere. Right. Southwest. Southwest. Okay, right. So when so you grew up, was it just you? Or did you have brothers, sisters? Um, I had two sisters and a brother. When so so four. Where do you fit into the four? I'm the eldest. The oldest of four. Yes, I know that scenario. So what was it like? Did you guys did you guys get along? Did you not like? Oh, like like all um, siblings, we had our moments, but uh, we all get along well now. And uh, two of the three are also novelists. Oh, is that right? Enough. Yeah. What what kind, what do they write? Uh, well, my brother Hugh H U W um, has written a middle grade trilogy about space pirates for Bloomsbury oh. um, called Space Jackers, and my sister um, Rebecca Powell has written um, a novel called The Brazilian Husband about uh, a woman who takes her adopted daughter back to Brazil to find his real father. Oh. And, uh, Wow. So, so were, so what were your parents like? I mean, did they, did they encourage you guys to read and write? Was that kind of part of your life growing up? Yeah. Um, my mother taught me to read before I went to school. So I could read by the time I was like four years old. Um, and you know, we used to go to the library. There was a, a, a local library in the village and we used to go there and take out like four or five books every, every few days and just like, read through them and I was very fortunate that that library had a, a really good sci-fi selection as well so so that was that right so that was that what you're so as a kid was that your thing like were you were you uh you know did, were you sort of just like a book kid or were you uh what what was your thing as a kid growing up I, I was a bit of everything I mean I was in I was just fantastically immersed in books i just used to read and read and read and read and read um i i would get through two or three books in a weekend sometimes um and i was you know obsessed with stars and planets and space and you know the star wars came out when i was seven years old and then battlestar galactica and buck rogers in the 25th century and the black hole and all that kind of huge post star wars boom in sci-fi yeah. um, and of course doctor who right uh, doctor who you know right from i started watching with tom baker and 
you know, uh, hooked. Still am. Um, so, so yeah, so I mean, stick stick on that for a minute. I want to actually ask you about Doctor Who because, so as a kid, so I didn't I didn't actually watch Doctor Who I until the last couple of years for no particular reason. I just one of those shows I just kind of didn't find until until later. But um, in terms of you know sci fi TV most of the bigger name shows and even movies are not typically associated with the UK, but Dr. Who is kind of like, you know, seems to be like the sci-fi show that came out of the UK. Was that still just sort of like a, um, you know, um, even when you were a kid, was it more cultish culturally when you were a kid or was it the kind of thing where like Dr. Who was up there with like the Beatles and Shakespeare and, um, I, I kind of missed the first kind of Doctor Who mania, which in the 60s with the Daleks and everything, it was, it, they were, you know, like the Beatles, it was everywhere. Um, I kind of missed that being born in 1970, but by the time I came in with the fourth Doctor and Tom Baker, it was part of the language, um, you know, Dalek, TARDIS, everything, you know, his scarf, his big hair. You know, he he was very he was totally part of mainstream culture. It was Saturday night TV, um, and in those days, there were only three channels, so the viewing figures were just viewing figures that Netflix can only dream about nowadays. Mm-hmm. You, you'd get like six or eight million people watching on a Saturday night because there was no no other TV channels. So um, those um, and in those days you know 99 percent of people didn't have video recorders either right. so you would only ever see something once doctor who was never repeated wow. so it, you would only ever see it once and then you would go to school the next day and you would kind of just talk to each other about it <laughs> madly yeah. um did you see this but did you see, and you would have to just remember it because it was it would never come again it was you'd just see it and it was gone um but it was just such a huge part of Saturday night. Everybody, you know, everybody would talk about it the next day. So, uh, so let me ask you something. So because I'm still somewhat new to it, um, I started, while I watched some of the Chris Eccleson ones. This is about a couple of years ago. I got a little distracted for, I can't remember why. And then when the latest iteration came out, you know, with, with Jody um, uh, Wheatley, Wheatley, sorry. Which Whitaker, sorry. And um, my wife and I, like, we both like it a lot. In the US at least, she's real kind of divisive as being the latest doctor. Um, and before it even aired, of course, it was like, how could you possibly have a woman be a doctor? That's blasphemy, you could never do it. Which, you know, I think any reasonable person would just kind of ignore that and, and move past it. But now that she's been on the show and I've seen, I don't know, the first season or, season and a half my wife and i we've really enjoyed it but i hear kind of mixed things you've since you've seen all the doctors what's your what's your take i think um i think she's fantastic i think she's a great doctor that's what, that's what might, i think <laughs> i'd like to see her get a little angrier mm. um one of the things i like about the doctor is he's always got uh i say he because in the past it has but there's always been this like edge of dangerousness to him Mm. um you know tom baker was a clown but when he could suddenly get very serious and you knew you were in a lot of trouble and you know even recent doctors like matt smith who was very young and a clip but he could suddenly turn on the gravitas and the Mm -mm. anger and you could feel that there was this like ancient burning anger inside him um i'd just like to see her do a little bit of that because she's been a bit kind of passive in reacting to all these revelations about her past um and i'd just like to see her get a bit more um cross about it and a bit more proactive about it but as a minor niggle i think she's a great doctor i love the fugitive doctor um that they've discovered the past you know far past iteration of the doctor um I, i'm really ashamed i've forgotten the actress's name now ruth something but um, I love that plot line. The fact there have been loads of incarnations of the Doctor before what we thought was the first incarnation. Mm-hmm. That, I think, has opened up the world in a whole different way. Um, so has Doctor, in the UK anyway, has, the, has Doctor Who 
in terms of its you know sort of cultural significance is it still kind of a real staple in the uk or has it kind of been somewhat diminished a bit it kind of went through this huge um it, it went through this huge period with uh, russell t davis um when uh, david tennant was the doctor mm. Um, and then with Matt Smith as well, it was the, it was huge. There was like uh, there's this big exhibition in Cardiff, like in, immersive exhibition and action figures everywhere, and it, it really w was huge. Um, I th I think it kind of it, it, it stuttered a bit um, when Peter Capaldi took over and towards the end of uh, Matt Smith's era, um, but from what I read on Twitter, the the viewing figures at the moment for um, the latest series in the UK are higher than for all the Marvel MCU series in the US. Oh, is that right? Wow. Which if you compare the populations is quite an amazing achievement. So, right, right. so I, I want to get back to so going back to sort of, you know, uh, culturally sort of where you kind of grew up. So England certainly has its regional differences, you know, Bristol being more in the Southwest, um, so just for us Americans who don't either have never been to the UK, I mean, I've been there a couple of times, but those have never been. So what's the culture sort of in Bristol compared with, for example, London? And then we talked a little bit about, about offline about in Manchester. And I just have a, a little uh, personal attachment to Manchester since I went to university there some years ago. Um, England and the UK is like... Um... It has even it, towns five or ten miles apart can have completely different accents. Um, Manchester, Leeds, um, Liverpool, Birmingham are all within about an hour's drive of each other, and all have completely different accents. And the towns and villages between them all have different accents. Um, I, I live in a small village just outside Bristol that has a very, very different accent from all the villages surrounding it because it grew up servicing the port of Bristol and the sailors coming into Bristol and was therefore shunned by the farming villages around it so oh. that it, it kind of developed its own accent and the villages around developed their own accent. So, and I mean, these were the days when you had to walk everywhere because, you know, unless you could afford a horse. So nobody really traveled very far outside of their, their local zone. So these like really re like micro specific accents, and micro specific cultures. Um, it's kind of like, I guess you have the differences between the States, but just cram all that into an Island, the size of, uh, the UK and which is you know half the size of California or something cram all those differences into something that space and you kind of get an idea of what the culture is like well it's interesting so geographically um so the, the UK is about the same size as New York State yeah. in the US New York is about 18 20 million people whereas the UK has got about 65 million people so you're really kind of boxed in top there. So let me ask you something. So I was in, I was, like I said, I was in Manchester for a while and I was there when Ryan Giggs was first coming up, you know, good old Giggsy. So is it your sworn oath as a Brit to love a, a bit of footy? <laughs> well, you can't really get away from it, but yeah. uh, who, 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 who is, who's your team? I don't really have a team. Um, no. I'm not, I, you know, but I guess I live closest to Bristol city's football ground. Uh -huh. And, you know, if you, you know, you, you can't go wrong wearing a city shirt in round here. You know, if I wandered into different bits of Bristol wearing a city shirt, I'd be in trouble because there'd be Bristol Rovers fans. So. All right. So I have to, so speaking, sticking on the, on the soccer theme. So have you seen Ted Lasso? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's that. Well. Sorry, I didn't mean to kill that. No, no, no. no. It, was, it, was, it was just a curiosity. Having been on both sides of it, I sort of, uh, I get, if you ever get a chance, it's, it's, it's worth it. So let I've me get good things. It's, it's great. Um, so let me go back a little bit. So as a kid, so you grew up, you kind of devoured, you were a reader, you, you were um, a lover of sci-fi. Were, 
was that something that you kind of, was that like a solo love or did you have like a, a group of friends back then who were into it like you were? Um, I had a couple of friends who were really into like Star Wars and um, when the, I mean, the Empire Strikes Back came out when we were nine or 10. So we were just like, and the Flash Gordon movie. Um, obviously we were too young to... Uh, pick up on a lot of the stuff that was going on in that but um we just loved it for what it was at, at 10 years old it was uh, just colorful and, um, and um, but yeah yeah i had some friends and we we used to you know run around in, in at school in the in the yard during recess and uh, um play at being you know in the hoth base or in you know play Blake seven or and everyone would argue about who was Avon and who was Blake and, um, you know, and there was space 1999 as well. Mm. Um, so, you know, Jerry Anderson, the Thunderbirds were always on TV and the star Trek original series was rerunning. Um, so we were just like fed this constant diet of science fiction and, um, there were the target novelizations of Doctor Who as well, which was for Doctor Who fans like me, that was the only place you could find Doctor Who. So you'd buy, you know, go to the library, get out these novelizations, read all these like first Doctor, second, third Doctor adventures in novel form. Um, and that was the closest you could get to reruns. So, right. Okay. So we, we touched on it a little bit before, and I want to kind of get back to it now. So, you said that uh, when you were a kid, did so? We, did you start writing when you were a kid? Like, when did you kind of first kind of get the bug to start, you know, putting your own ideas onto paper? Uh, the first book I remember writing, I would have been eight or nine years old, and I I've still got it somewhere. It's called Spiky the Dragon. And it's about a knight who is riding along the road and a dragon's egg rolls out of its mother's nest and the knight finds it and it hatches out and he says, I will call you Spiky. And they become best friends and go off on adventures. And um, I've kind of written ever since then. I would, I would, as I said, I'd watch Star Trek. I would watch Blake Seven or whatever and then sit down and write shamelessly derivative stories. Um based on on those and um you know it was always kind of i was always going to write sci-fi that was always the plan it was only when i started to get a bit older and people said you can't possibly make money doing that <laughs> that i um i kind of started to doubt and drift away and try and think of other things to do but yeah right from the beginning i wanted to write sci-fi so when did you um so, you know, as, as kids, a lot of us, I was the same, you know, I kind of wrote when I was a kid on and off, but when did you, when would you say you kind of first kind of really were serious about it? Um, when I was 17, 18, uh, so in what we call the sixth form over here, so upper high school, or I'm not quite sure how, what term it is yeah. over there, but the exams you do before you go to university, um, I I um, won a short story competition, which I mentioned, which the prize was to go and meet Diana Wynne-Jones, um, who wrote Howl's Moving Castle and other novels, um, and to have her criticise my work. So I sat down in a coffee shop with her and she took me through my work, and it was my first professional critique, um, which really opened my eyes to a lot of things. I still have all her notes. That she hand wrote really um, so what was i mean i'm sure that must have been a pretty um, impressionable experience for you what yeah. what are some of the big takeaways from that from that meeting the big the big takeaways she was saying just because you she said you've discovered that if you write if you want something to happen you can just write it but you shouldn't <laughs> because you should think about why you're doing it. You can't just have the Monty Python foot coming down and going splat whenever you want to. You have to work it into the story. Um, she also drew my attention to my portrayal of the female character, um, which, you know, being 17 or 18 year old, uh, 
and I was growing up on a diet of kind of 50s and 60s sci-fi so the female characters were not wonderfully fleshed out shall we say and there was a lot of gasping and sighing and fainting and she was like mm, no. no so <laughs> I actually kind of opened my eyes in that way a bit, which which was fantastic. It made me think like these female characters should behave like the women you actually know in real life. And that was like, oh, and that was like a big kind of turning point, which I think still resonates through my work today. And I, and I, I apologize for, so the author, I'm, I'm not familiar with her and I'm, I don't know if a lot of Americans are. So just who, who is she? Just so we have some sense of it. Uh, well, there was a Studio uh, Ghibli film uh, called Howl's Moving Castle, which was based on one of her novels. Okay. Um, she wrote a lot of fantasy um, and, um, you know, had some hugely successful books. So, mm -hmm. yeah, she's... Got um, it. Okay. And when, when I met her, she was quite a an imposing, witchy kind of woman with this piercing eyes and, and kind of quite uh, she was like a force of nature it was quite uh, quite something as a, a, a 17 year old oh that must so 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 at that moment right so when you, you you sit down with her were you nervous were you excited both different like just what's that moment like for you um at the time i had no idea who she was <laughs> Um, it's only in retrospect, I think, like, wow. Um, at the time, you know, I was a fairly, um, shall we say, easily distracted teenager. Um, but it was, it was quite, you know, I was thrilled to be out getting coffee. <laughs> you know, that seemed like a very grown up thing to be doing um, and hanging out and, and, but it was the first time I ever felt my writing had been taken seriously as something that wasn't like a school thing, mm. but as, as a thing that I was doing outside of school that could be, you know, possibly a career. And she was approaching her critique in that way, which nobody had ever done before. Did that give you, from that meeting going forward, did that give you more confidence going forward? Um in the long run yes initially it was like oh shit i've never been quite so eviscerated before <laughs> um but you know <laughs> thinking about it all her, all her points were very good points and they kind of made me a, a much stronger and a better writer and a, a couple of years later i went on to study creative writing at university for for three years um under uh helen dunmore was one, one of the teachers there the the um prize-winning novelist so I it certainly helped set me on the on the course that I had been sort of meandering towards it certainly kind of focused me a bit yeah definitely okay so you have this meeting you can't you you write some more stuff and at a certain point you you've written about science fiction for publications like the Guardian the Irish Times SFX and the Engineer so what what's Tell me how you got into that. Um, <clears throat> mostly through my fiction writing, people have approached me and said, really enjoy your fiction writing. Would you like to write something about, about that or about certain aspects of sci-fi? Um, that, that was certainly how I got the job with uh, the engineer. Um, and weirdly enough, that's how I, I used to be a music critic for Acoustic Magazine. Oh, is that right? Uh, yeah, and that was because somebody liked a short story I'd written and going, have you ever tried writing music reviews? And I said, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> and, they went, well. <laughs> and they said, do you know anything about acoustic music? And I said, no, not a thing. And they said, well, we'll, we'll pay you. I went, okay. Ah. So, yeah. So, you know, I, I, got to inter yeah, I got to interview like Nils Lofgren, Bruce Springsteen's guitarist and, and, lots of other people and write CD reviews. And oh, I just, nice. I discovered the best thing about being a music journalist is the free CDs. Right. But the worst thing about being a music journalist yeah. is the free CDs. <laughs> because 10,000 of them. 10,000 10, of them and 50% you know, of them are terrible. Yes. 
So, so who are you? So, so on the music side, who are who are your favorite interviews? Uh, well, Nils Lofgren was a fantastic interview. We talked for like three hours. Um, we really hit it off. We uh, chatted. He told me stories about being on tour with the E Street Band, some of the stuff they got up to in the tour bus. He was fantastically open, amazingly witty. Uh, the stories were scandalous, everything you'd want. And when I said thank you very much and hung up the phone, and looked at my recorder, the batteries had run out after 20 minutes. Oh, God, I hate that. Oh, that's the worst. So I had to write the the entire feature based on the first 20 minutes where we were just kind of awkwardly oh. starting to talk. So. Oh. oh, painful. So, yeah, I, I class that as one of the great lost interviews of our time. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so... So let me ask you, so um, as an author, so what's the appeal of, so I know that you're, you focus on science fiction, but there's all sorts of things you could write. Why? Is it just that science fiction was sort of just seeped into you from the beginning? Or what is it about sci-fi that you, as because as a, as a reader and as a viewer, you have one experience, but as a writer, it's a very different experience. So what, what's the appeal for you? Uh, well, as I said, I kind of grew up completely immersed in science fiction. Um, when I was at university, we were very much discouraged from writing science fiction at all. Um, you know, if you tried to write science fiction, they'd look down their nose at you. Um, but when I got older and I decided to start writing seriously, it was very much a case of write what you love, write what you want to read. Um, because that passion and that enthusiasm comes through. Um, and if you're writing something you're really enthused about, then your reader will be really enthused about. And the other thing I love about sci-fi is that it's, whereas, you know, if you're writing a modern realist literary novel about a depressed English lecturer in South London, you're kind of, possibilities are fairly limited whereas if you're writing sci-fi you can write using the entirety of time and space right. from the beginning of the universe to the end of the universe and in stretching to infinity in every direction as your canvas so you can invent any kind of society you want to in order to illustrate your point if you want to write a society about how weird it would be if everyone had a pet talking parrot. You can invent a society where everyone has a pet talking parrot and illustrate it. I mean, that's a very facile uh, yeah. example. Obviously. You're, you're limited only by your imagination. Exactly. You you can set up any thought experiment, any political experiment, and and just play it out as as if it's uh, as if it's real. Yeah. So you've written dozens of short stories and you've also written novels. So for you, what's the appeal in writing short fiction? Because I do both as well, writing short fiction. What's the appeal of the short fiction that you don't get with a novel? And then what's the appeal of writing the novel that you don't get when writing short fiction? Short fiction, I found when I was starting out, was a very good way to kind of experiment and find my voice because I could try things out in sort of four or 5,000 words um, without, you know, having to spend a year writing a novel. Um, so from that point of view, I found it was a very good way to kind of develop my own voice, develop my own style. Um, the appeal of what you get with a novel is paid. Um, <laughs> The best creative part of writing a novel is the money. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I mean, I, I always wanted to write novels. And then once I started writing novels, I kind of, the, the short fiction tailed off because I found it very hard to write short fiction once I had transitioned to novels. I've, I have no idea why, but every idea I had seemed to be about 90,000 words long. Um, so I've, I've, writ I've written some novellas, um, since then, but actual short stories have, have been few and far between over the last 10 years or so. Yeah. So let me ask you, so as authors, our respective cultures, to varying degrees, influence what and how we write. What do you think you bring to the table as a British 
sci-fi author that might be distinct from say, you know, being an American author? I think the difference between American and British science fiction is a lot of American science fiction is kind of influenced by your your history of kind of expansion and carving out territory and colonizing and from British point of view we are on the opposite trajectory in that we had an empire um, a lot of Victorian fiction, uh, Heart of Darkness, and so on, is is about going out into you know into the world and exploring the same ways. Um, I guess maybe Heart of Darkness for us was like Forbidden Planet for you. It was, um... <clears throat> but our experience is the post-colonial mm. experience where we've done that. We made a mess of it, and. Um, we've lost it and divested ourselves, and we are lapsing into a sort of post empire period. Whereas you, you, you American fiction, especially in the fifties, sixties and seventies was still very much, we can go out there, we can discover stuff, we can explore. And we were like, well, we've done all that and we're tired now. And so our, our fiction has that kind of slightly more weary kind of, um, Welchmerz, to use a German word, mm. um, to it that maybe um, it, it, there's more optimism in the American mm. experience. At least, at least there has been in the past. I mean, obviously there are more nuanced works being written at the moment and 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 in the recent past. But that seems to be kind of a fundamental um, difference between them and i'm i'm wondering now in the kind of post trump post almost post democracy era where america is maybe sliding more into that kind of cynical tired mindset that we've been in since the the end of the second world war yeah, so. it's, def it's definitely there's no doubt that to varying degrees it's been it's been a real struggle the last half dozen years and yeah who knows? Um, so I want to move on to some to some some big news from uh, from our guest here. So quick a quick interlude for anyone who came in a little late. If you have any questions or comments for me or Gareth, send them put them in the chat box, and we'll get to a few um, at the end. So I'm going to share my screen because um, we've got some exciting stuff to show you here. And oops, uh, here we go. And okay. Here we go. So are we seeing this here. All right. So talk to me about Embers of War. Um, <clears throat> Embers of War is the book I always wanted to read. I think it's a book set in the aftermath of a giant space conflict in a lot of fiction you get stories building up to a big war. So Star Wars, for instance, is all building up to the big final battle. Um, this story takes place three years after that. So, you know, after the Ewoks have finished eating all the stormtroopers and everybody's moved on. This is how the troops on both sides of the battle go on with their lives. Um, and one of the characters is a warship who took part in the final atrocity that ended the war and has since resigned her commission and is now working for a rescue organization she's sentient <coughs> excuse me um and she's crewed by a, a captain who was on the opposite side of the the conflict um and together they learn to Oh, oh, excuse me. Um, together, they, they kind of start to learn to work together and to put their differences behind them and to kind of come to terms with who they used to be um, and what they did. Um, and at the same time, they find themselves embroiled in a, a conflict um, and a conspiracy uh, run by people who kind of want to restart that war and 
to get it to end slightly differently. So it's very much a case of, you know, the war is over, but we still have to win the peace. Um, but it's also a, a, a sort of military science fiction, but from the point of view of people who've been through a huge conflict and uh, are trying to work out what they do now with their lives and how they how they go forward. So Embers of War, it's not only an award winner, but it's actually in development to become a TV series. So if I understand correctly, uh, Breck Eisner, who is one of the directors on The Expanse, which is amazing, is part of the development team for your series. So first of all, huge congrats on that. I think it's the dream that we're all hoping for and, and I'm rooting for you. Um, it must be exciting and maybe a little bit nerve wracking. So tell us what's going, what, what can you tell us about, about the show? What, what's, what's happening? Well, what I can tell you is that uh, Stampede and WIIP uh, are their produ production company and the studio who are developing it. The pilot episode has been written by Gary Graham, who is has done a fantastic job on the script. Um, I, I've read it and I just think it's amazing. Um, he's currently writing another draft with Breck Eisner, who is signed up as director. Um, and I've, as you say, he's he's directed many episodes of The Expanse, so we know he knows how to do space stuff. Yeah. Um, so once the the new draft of the script is in place, and I believe a lot of that is, is kind of trimming off things that are just too expensive to film and finding other ways to do them. Mm. Um, then they will take that to a, a network such as Netflix or Sci-Fi or, or, or Amazon and pitch it to them. And so, at yeah. that point, right. I get paid, which would be very nice. <laughs> yes, I would. Um, it would so, be yeah. very nice. But um, I think having Breck on board, having a good script, having a um, reputable producer and studio, it's got everything behind it, so it stands as good a chance as anything, really. I don't, I don't think there's anything we could do to give it a better chance. So it's in the, the lap of the networks now to see if any, any of them will, will buy it. So, 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 how, so for, I mean, this is, we're, we're all after, so many of us are after the same thing. So how, how did this come to be? Uh, well, this came to be when um, Embers of War came out, when it was first published, like nearly four years ago. Um, we were approached for the for the rights um, mm. by by the uh, by Stampede, uh, the production company. They um, I don't know what put them on to us in the first place, um, but I think uh, Embers won the BSFA award. British Science Fiction Association Award uh, for that year. And I think that just pinged, pinged them on the radar. And I think they were maybe looking for a, a, a post-expanse series. Right. Um, and and they, they took the rights down. And that was before either of the sequels had actually been published. So, right. Well, we're big. So, so myself and on behalf of the show, fingers crossed, we're, we're, root, we're rooting for you. Thank you. All right, so okay, that was great. But now it's the time for a special segment where we spin the wheel on the wheel are seven possible categories, including some new ones I added just for tonight. Wherever it lands is what you get, and the categories are Attack of the Clones, Creature Feature, Quantum Leap, Dream Weaver, Music Lover, Brit Myth, and Stranger in a Strange Land. All right, you ready? Yeah, as I'll ever be. All right, what do we got? Um... We got, ah, oh, there you go, Brit Myth. Okay. Okay. All right. So Americans are forever fascinated, for right or for wrong, for better or for worse, we're fascinated by the Brits. What's one misconception that you think Americans have about Brits that you'd like to clear up? Oh, where do I start? Um, <laughs> go for it. We, we don't all live in stately homes. Um, we no longer use gas lamps as street lamps. Um, we don't boil our food um, to death. Uh, 
we haven't all got bad teeth um uh, where do i where do i stop um you know, you know what what are some of the myths you've heard about british people that i can puncture uh let's see uh well it's so having i have actually a lot of british friends and i think it's not quite as much as it used to be but brits in general compared with americans are much more reserved do you think that's to me, it seems like it's starting to change a little bit more where you seem to be a little bit more emotionally open than in maybe generations past. Or is, is that accurate, not accurate? I think if you went to any town centre in the UK on a fr- about 10 o'clock on a Friday night, you would not have the impression that British people were, were reserved. No, not at all. <laughs> Not at all. It, it, uh, you might have the impression they were all violent alcoholics, but not <laughs> reserved. No, okay. the the kind of received pronunciation, terribly polite, um, st- you know, steed from the Avengers kind of stereotype is um, pretty much a thing of the past. Mm. Um, e- 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 the, uh, I remember, ah, what was the name of the guy who played the Penguin in the 1966 Batman? Burgess Meredith. Burgess Meredith, yes, of course. There is on YouTube a fantastic uh, information film he made for US troops coming over to England uh, during the Second World War for how to blend in. Um, with the population, there's a fantastic one about the local pub, like how not to go in and, and go, you know, be all flash and flash your cash around and start gobbing off. Um, and how to kind of relate to English people and everything. And it's it's almost like a manual for time travellers from the future going back to this medieval society. It's, it's very <laughs> weird. Um, and I, I, I think if, if you kind of came over with that picture of the UK, that it's kind of slightly bucolic and agricultural and everybody is a, you know, is either walking around in top hats or is, is a peasant, you'll be somewhat surprised by the amount of... Um... For sure. All right. So thanks, Garrett. You and I, are, we're going to go to our advice column. You and I are both in the writing business. So what's the best and worst writing advice someone ever gave you oh geez i've had so much bad advice um the best advice is is probably finish what you're writing um and read a lot read in your chosen genre and outside your chosen genre Mm. um read good books and read bad books and work out what it is about the bad books that makes them bad and what it is about the good books that makes them good. Mm. Um, as to bad advice, I don't want to repeat any of it in case anyone takes it out of context. Um, no, let's, let, let's, hear, let's hear it. Oh, I've just, I've just heard so much stuff. Like you must always have the main character, um, you, you know, declare a love interest in the first three pages, or you must, always have the you know you must always have you know a certain thing happen with by page five or you must you 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 must have like a killer first line or you know or you you know the the truth of the matter is you you must just write the book usually the the final chapter will tell you what the first chapter should have been the ending of the book will tell you what so you nine times out of ten you'll have to go back and rewrite the beginning of the book so don't spend forever trying to come up with a f- perfect first line before you start writing because it you know you'll probably have to change it finish the book tell the story you want to tell in the way you want to tell it don't get bogged down in like structure all this three act structure and all this kind of stuff yes you must have a kind of feel for the way stories work like a beginning middle and end but don't kind of think like the save the cat um, kind of mindset of like, oh, we must have an incite- inciting incident by page 15, otherwise everything is lost. Um, 
just write the story. I mean, we've all seen Star Wars. We don't need to see the same structure again and again and again and again and again. So just write us a story. Make it entertaining. Um, give it a beginning. Give it a middle. Give it an end. Maybe have a read through Aristotle. Um, uh, well, not Aristotle. Who wrote the... Um, Never mind. Um, you know, just have a basic... Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's quarter to two in the morning. Yeah, no, I know. I know. Well, don't, don't worry, we're, 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 get, we're getting to the end. So I'll let you off that one. So let me ask you. So now we're going to discuss whether or not you have thick skin. So as writers, when we put our work and therefore ourselves out there, criticism of all kinds inevitably comes with it. The good, the bad, and everything in between. So how do you feel about reviews? Do you take them to heart? Do you let them roll off you? Or do some stick with you more than others? Um, obviously, I take the good ones completely to heart. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh. <laughs> See, that's I've asked this question about 100 times. And that is the first time anyone I feel has truly answered honestly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the bad ones, you, you think, oh, you think, oh, they didn't get what I was trying to say, or, oh, they missed the point, or, you know, oh, well, well I thought it was good. Um, reviews are subjective. Um, I, you just have to look at Amazon for that. Um, y- you'll get 500 reviews saying, I love this book, it's great, and then two people saying, this is the worst book I've ever written. Uh, ever, sorry, ever read. Uh, that was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? <laughs> um, you know, and they will, you know, so it's, you can't control reviews, you can't control what people think of your books. If your book's getting published and selling, good. Yeah. Um, some people will hate them. And you just have to, you just have to not obsess about that and just think, well, more people like them than hate them. So just keep keep going. There you go. All right. So we're going to take a couple of questions from the folks who are watching. I got a bunch here for you. So here's one. Favorite Star Wars movie or movie outside... Favorite Star Wars movie or movies outside of the original trilogy? Outside of the original trilogy. Hmm. Um, can I say TV series? Because The Mandalorian is really, <laughs> yeah. really good. Yeah, yes, it is. It's very good. The Mandalorian, I think, for me, was got back to the closest of the feel I had for mm. the original trilogy. Um, Agreed. I, I really enjoyed Solo. You know, I did. I did, too. It's actually, I, I'm not going to necessarily say, is it the best? I don't know, but it's the most, to me, it's the most fun. I just, yeah. have, I've seen it three or four times. And every time I watch it, I say, God, I want another one. Yeah. I, I, I watched Rogue One and I thought, yes, it's very good. Yes. I've, I've never rewatched it. Mm. Whereas Solo is just stupid <laughs> mm. and daft and it's just a heist movie in space. Mm-hmm. And it's people cosplaying as these characters we know right. from the original trilogy, basically. But it's fun. And it's yeah. just, a, you know, it's just a daft way to spend an hour and a half. It's like a comfort movie. Yeah, agreed. Um, so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it for those reasons. Um, but, yeah, I'd have to, have to save The Mandalorian. Okay, so I've got another one for you. If you could put your name on one sci-fi book or movie that you didn't create, what would it be? Oh man, um, probably one of the culture books by Ian M. Banks. Hmm. Okay, I love those books. Um, absolutely, absolutely love them. So yeah, I'd, I'd 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 steal one from him. Okay, and last one. So, not Star Wars, but Star Trek. What's your favorite Star Trek movie or series? Well. I say when I I grew up at the age of four and five watching the original series, so kind of original Kirk, Spock, McCoy are burned into my brain from an early age. They're they're kind of part of my yes. imaginative DNA now. 
Um, so I kind of love, um, I kind of love the original series. I don't, I haven't watched it much recently because I, I, I fear that from such a great distance it will not hold up. I mean, it, it may well do, but um, <clears throat> I've really enjoyed Discovery. Um, I, I drifted away from Star Trek during Deep Space Nine and Voyager and and Enterprise. It, they didn't really kind of do it for me, but um, Discovery has kind of taken that kind of slightly batshit crazy <laughs> edge that the original series had and brought that back because, you know, Kirk would go to castles or, or weird stuff or yeah. there was one episode where he spent, a, you know, a year living as a Native American or something because the Enterprise was away for a year, apparently. Um, you know, there were just these weird ass kind of experimental things and Discovery's kind of brought that back. I mean, the first season they were traveling around the galaxy on mushrooms and then they went to the alternate universe and they came back and they've gone into the future and um, they've kind of, you know, they brought back that weirdness that the original Star Trek had, I think, and that kind of sense of family and fun without being too... I, I, I think Voyager and DS9, they had kind of... They, they'd set up kind of conflicts between the characters, but at the end of the day, it all felt a bit cosy, whereas... Um, discovery it feels like you know more dangerous when, yeah when people get into fights and they get into disagreements then you know they've had a different captain every series because they just you know people get killed off or they get shuffled off or moved off and it's i like that it's it's um it gives it a bit more of an edge and um and michelle yo just she could do no wrong she could do no wrong but her character is just delightful because she honestly doesn't give a toss and will gladly kill anybody who gets yes. in her way yes and she's getting her own show so yeah fantastic yeah. yes all right so uh before we break we're going to go back i'm going to share my screen again and uh we're going to do a little wrap up and then uh we're going to call it a day all right so so we talked about uh embers of war but you've also got with us so what do we got here uh, this is Stars and Bones. This is a brand new um, series that's coming out from Titan Books, probably in February, if all these paper shortages and everything we keep hearing about don't affect the printing um, or the release date. But hopefully, yes, coming out at the beginning of next year. Lovely um, quote there from John Scalzi on the front. Yes. Um, it's, I would describe it as Battlestar Galactica meets cosmic horror um interesting it's about an alien intelligence who comes along and kicks humanity off earth um for the good of the earth not humanity he tell us to you know give us some spaceships to say get off the earth um go where you like but promise you'll never mess up another biosphere um and so we stumble around the galaxy and get into a whole lot of trouble right, right on well that's it. Gareth. That sounds great. Uh, can't wait to check that one out. And then as for me, uh, if you're up for a little Blade Runner style sci-fi with your crime and mystery and maybe just a touch of horror, I'll en encourage you folks to check out my sci-fi noir Fractured Lives featuring my hard-boiled intergalactic private eye, Angela Hardwick, part Doctor Who, part Blade Runner, and part Philip Marlowe in Fractured Lives. Hardwick is hired to find out if a college freshman who is also a galaxy design savant is suffering from a nervous breakdown or is the victim of an urban legend known as the Scarlet Raj. Fractured Lives is available on Amazon and published by Crazy 8 Press. And if you want a, a signed copy, you can order it directly from me. All right. Well, that's our show, folks. Thanks again. This was my 50th show. So thank you so much. It was a great way to celebrate. And I want to thank Gareth for a great hour. And of course, everyone who's watching at home. I'm your host, Russ Colchimiro. And with just one more episode left in 2021, I will see you all next week. Take care, guys. And thanks again, Gareth, for coming by. Thank all, right. You. all right. Thanks, folks. Take care.